Hey there, it's Daryl with another board gem. A video that can be used either to learn about some old obscure game that you can't find in stores anymore, um, at least one that's not really talked about much anymore, or worst case, you can simply use it as a soporific um, and use my soothing, boring voice to lull you to sleep. Um, I'm fine with either as long as I get the views. <clears throat> now this week, now this week I'm doing one of the most unique games that's out there. The game is Filthy Rich. Uh, this was designed by Richard Garfield, that Richard Garfield, and published by Wizards of the Coast in the late 90s. Uh, Wizards of the Coast, of course, uh, in the 90s was most famous for Magic the Gathering, which Richard Garfield designed. But Richard Garfield also did a bunch of board and card games uh, that were published by Wizards, such as The Great Dal Moody and Robo Rally, and this one. Uh, this was published before Wizards of the Coast was bought by Hasbro. Uh, it's for two to five players, takes about 45 minutes to play, really dependent on number of players. And the box says ages 14 to adult. Um, no, you, you can go younger for sure. Maybe, I don't know, maybe nine, 10 and up. The idea of the game is that the game board is actually a binder. The binder has four pages of sleeves, card sleeves. And you're putting cards representing the signs, the, the uh, outdoor signs for your business into these sleeves. And it represents a sort of a 3D space of whose signs are visible behind whose other signs, etc. It's an American style game. What does that even mean anymore? Um, I should probably get into this more in the later part, the why it's a gem part, but you have to understand that, I mean, nowadays, new games that come out, it's, it's all, they're all hybrids, right? But back in the, the earlier days, like, the, like around this time, there were almost, you could say, there were almost two distinct styles of board games. That's excluding stuff like party games and, and collectible card games and, and all sorts of other genres. But if you're talking about like just kind of board and card games, you almost got a sense of two distinct genres. Um, you'd have the German style games. I mean, you'd have games like Catan and Bonanza and El Grande and stuff. And you'd have what were called the American style games. And this is definitely in the latter category. Um, I would describe American style games as more of a, there's still strategy involved, but they're less worried about making it balanced and more worried about making it kind of a wild ride, right? Like, oh, you don't know what's going to happen and you know, you're just along for the ride. In the end, somebody wins and you had fun. Why don't I show you how it plays? And then afterwards, we'll talk about what makes it special, what makes it a gem. Oh, one more thing. Um, I was experimenting with the camera a bit. Normally, like with this camera right now, I'm, I'm using an iPad for the camera. Um, which is, as you can see, it's not really high def. You're welcome. You, you wouldn't want, I saw my face in high def once. I wish I could forget it. Um, but I did try to use my phone for the, the camera for this, so I can try to catch some high def uh, imagery of the game. It's just something I'm experimenting with. My phone's not great, and I had this weird auto-focusing problem. It didn't, I didn't find it too, too bad. It's worse at the beginning, but it gets better later. Anyway, it's just, I'm just experimenting, so I'll give that a try and hopefully it's, it's not too bad. To set up the game, place the binder in the middle of the table between the players. And you'll see inside the binder, there are four sheets of sleeves. And they're numbered four at the top, down to one at the bottom. You're gonna leave it on the one page so the very last page. And you'll notice on the back it has numbers one through nine. That'll be important later. You'll have some paper money, give each player $10, and you'll have three decks of cards. This deck is the business signs, and you don't need to shuffle these. You're just gonna keep those nearby. Players can uh, fish through it whenever they need a business. These are the trophies. This is the important thing in the game. This is the goal, is to get these trophies. Uh, the first player to get three trophies wins. And they range in cost from six all the way up to 45. But also note these, these coin symbols 
which is how much money you pay in taxes. Whenever you pay taxes, you'll pay $1 per coin. So the more expensive trophies, well that one's fine, but some of the more expensive trophies cost a lot in taxes. Usually I just keep this face up and generally people will just be buying the top trophy from the deck. But note, like for example, this trophy costs $8, but you actually pay less in taxes than the seven. So, I mean, ideally you do something like this, you'd kind of stagger them a bit, but depending on how much table space you have, I usually just keep them in a stack. And finally you have this deck of cards. This is where the, the main action is here. You're going to shuffle up this deck and give each player five. Then you're ready to start. Make sure you have the dice uh, nearby too. This is just four ten-sided and one six-sided. And like I said, the goal of the game is to get three trophies. Uh, the first player to get three trophies wins the game, or it's also possible for all the players to go bankrupt except for one, and then that player wins. Now these cards, there's three different types of cards. You have businesses, which are built on the board, that is this binder here, and they have a cost, and they have a number of taxes you have to pay if you own this business, and an amount of money that you get if the business is hit. When the business is hit, that represents a customer seeing the sign and deciding to, deciding to go into the business and giving you their money. Assets are a little bit similar in that they have a cost and an amount in taxes that you pay. And while businesses, it is possible to sell them for petty cash, assets stay in front of you for the whole game, unless the card says there's a way to get rid of them. The final type are the action cards, these blue cards. When you play an action card, you'll just do what it says, then the card gets discarded. So play is clockwise. The first thing that you do on your turn is you may optionally buy one trophy. You just pay the cost. You can technically buy any trophy you want. Usually you'll buy the cheapest one, depending on how sensitive you are to taxes. And then from your hand of five cards, you can play two of them. Uh, you can always discard a card to just get one dollar, or you can play the card. And if you play the action card, you do what the action says, and then the card just gets discarded. That's one of your two actions. If you want to build an asset, you take the asset, you put it in front of you, you pay the cost, and then it'll give you some benefit over the course of the game. But let's talk about businesses, because this is the real, the real core of the game. So if you decide to play a business card, here's what happens. First of all, you pay the cost, you pay the $5, you're going to take this card and put it in front of you to show that you own this business. Now, if other players, other players might have the same card as you, but if you own the business, they can't play that card. They could still discard it for a dollar, but they can't play it while your business is, is in play. And then you're going to fish through the uh, sign deck to find the matching sign for the business. Now. This one just shows one card, but you'll see there's actually businesses that span multiple cards, their signs. And so you'll see how that works in a second. Then you take this sign and you sleeve it into one of the nine slots on the current page. You would just, you pick one of them and you just slide it in there like that. Later on, when dice are rolled, we're gonna see what signs the customer looks at. And as you can see right now, it's visible here, but even on page four, the sign is still visible. You can think the binder is kind of 3D space where the customers are, at this case, kind of far away, but they can still see your sign. But then of course, later on, other businesses may build signs that cover yours and then are not visible if you're on one of the, the earlier pages. In fact, if you, if you place a business card in a sleeve and you cover a visible sign, so if you were to sleeve, if this sign was already there, and then later on on a, on a later page somebody wants to build here, they would have to pay the owner of this business $2 for every card of theirs that's covered. But only visible ones, so if there was one under this one, they wouldn't have to pay them anything. After you do your three actions, then you roll the dice. The first thing you do is you roll the business dice. This represents the customers. On page one, the last page, you would only roll one die. But on page four, you, are, you roll all four dice. 
It represents the number of customers who might potentially see your sign. These customers are, are closer, so there's some signs behind them. There aren't as many customers there. So on page one, you're just gonna roll one die. For, for every number that's rolled, you look and find that spot. So here we are, this is number one, and this is the sign, there's a sign here. This is a hit. And so this business will get its owner $5. If you roll multiple dice, which can happen, for example, if we're on page two, be rolling two dice. And if they were both ones, like so, that would be two hits. That's two customers entering your business, and you would get $10. And of course, like I showed you before, there may be multi-sleeve uh, multi signs. And that increases the likelihood that a customer will see your sign. So now that business is a hit on a two or a three in this case. That's how the hits work. But it's also possible, because it's a 10-sided die, there's only nine numbers, you can also roll a 10. Or the binder says zero. I've seen a lot of 10-sided dice with zero, but mine say 10 anyway. So when you roll a 10 or zero, that's, that represents paying taxes. And every play, for every zero or 10 that's rolled, every player has to pay taxes and they pay $1 for every coin symbol that's visible on their assets and their businesses and also their trophies. It is possible if you're short on money to sell a business. You can sell a business anytime on your turn before you roll the dice or if ever you roll the dice and it's a zero or 10, you have to pay taxes and you can't afford it, you can choose to sell a business and you simply sell it for $2 per sign card. So Sven's Swedish Tacos would only net you $2 if you sell it, but this Columbus Travel Agency would get you 4 And the nice thing about it is that any businesses you sell, you don't have to pay the taxes on. So you'll get a little bit of cash for it and you also avoid taking the tax hit for it. It is possible to go bankrupt. If you have to pay taxes and you no longer have any, any money and any uh, businesses that you can sell, you go bankrupt. All your businesses and assets and your cards get discarded with the exception of the trophies. Any trophies you have will actually get auctioned. And the minimum bid is this amount and the bids will go around the table. All the other players will have a chance to bid um, on those trophies that you have. After you roll the white dice, you then roll the red die. This is the page die. And it tells you what page to flip to. If you roll a one, two, three, or four, you're going to flip to the respective page. A five or a six means you just stay on the current page. And then it's the next player's turn. So you keep playing like that, clockwise around the table, until either all players go bankrupt except for one, or one player gets three trophies. And that player wins. That's it, you're ready to play Filthy Rich. Have you ever seen a game like this before? It's so unique, the fact that somebody could even come up with this idea of using a binder and its pages to represent 3D space is amazingly unique. And I'm gonna be honest with you, when you know, you've been in the hobby a long time, you do kind of value that novelty <laughs> of there's no other game quite like it, right? I would not regret having this in my collection because when I play it, there's no other game in my collection that would be even close to this experience. Now, <clears throat> it's tough to say whether it's recommended to modern audiences because it is a very unique game, but you know the hobby has kind of moved on from that style of game. It's very, very random, right? Um, you're getting money if your businesses are rolled by the roll of the die and you might not get rolled, and so it's hard for you to make money. Other players may get tons of money. It's just kind of the way the game goes. It's a, it's a wild ride of a game, right? And all sorts of stuff happens. You can get tons of taxes, which cripples everybody, or or one person's going to run off with the, with the victory early on. It's very, very random. And you know what? Maybe that's not going to be appealing to uh, some people. This is not... I mean, there, don't get me wrong. There is there are important decisions to make. The winner of the game can't really profess to say they've had, they had the best strategy. It certainly helped them, but 
almost just like in real life, because I know as a business owner, right, it's not all up to me. I can do a great job, but in the end, you also need some luck uh, to have some success. So it represents that part really well, at least. But yeah, really random, really unpredictable. I mean, back in the old days, if it, there weren't, I guess there weren't that many, weren't as many choices nowadays. Oh my God, there's tons of games in the world. And, you know, if you don't like a game, you just move on and play something else, right? But when there aren't as many choices and you find a game that you like, but it has some, some something that just bugs you about it, um, you don't give up on it, right? Uh, you, you put some work into it. You say, well, how can I make this better for my group? And this game has generated a lot of variants. I recommend you go on the internet. Um, you'll see a bunch of variants. You can play it without the variants, but have a look at them and see which ones might fit your group if you're interested in playing this game. Um, if you're a modern gamer and you really want to have a really super well-balanced game, I want to say that, first of all, this might not be the game for you, but if you still want to give it a go, yeah, check out some of those variants for sure. It really isn't for everyone, this, this old style of game. But like I said, it is unique. Um, there's really no other game like it at all. Um, it, this production doesn't really hold up a great deal uh, to modern standards, I feel, at least to like a modern hobby standards. The artwork, um, which, is, which is delightful in its own way, is like, A, it's over the top. It's obviously not very realistic. It's like they were trying to be funny, but it, it was by somebody who wasn't very funny. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. I apologize. Um, you know, the, the jokes I could come up with, and I'm not, I'm not that funny a guy, so. Um, so, you know, like a modern production would certainly, you know, I would probably go with a slightly more realistic theme, you know, maybe, maybe something like a Times Square, Hong Kong kind of, uh, you know, busy kind of street with like more, I don't know, more realistic signs, but they're trying to add some, some fun factor by having silly businesses. That's not really my cup of tea. I really f would feel uncomfortable recommending this to everybody. Uh, like don't go like immediately out and buy it and think this is the greatest game ever. It's, but it's a very unique style of game. And, you know, if you do what, what we used to call the Jones theory, I don't know if anybody still uses that anymore, where you have two kind of similar ideas for games in your collection but in almost all cases you would pick one over the other then the other you don't need in your collection right but there's no game like this so if you have this in your collection you're going by that kind of game collection um, maintenance model um, <laughs> you probably won't ever have a reason to get rid of this unless you don't like it which is fair I happen to like it because it's like I said it's a wild ride Right. Uh, this was introduced to me by by some friends, and when I sat down, I'm like, I this is not my style of game. I'm really not going to like it. Um, but in the end, I had a lot of fun with it. Um, and you know, of course, mostly the players you're playing with, you know, there's lots of dice rolling, so there's lots of cursing the bad dice luck. There's a little bit of cheering, which it, honestly, every board game could use a little bit of cheering, right? You know, if you if you're on one of the earlier pages, the higher numbered pages, and you have a few signs visible and you roll those, somebody rolls those dice and uh, and your business has come up multiple times and you're raking in the dough, you, you can't help but feel happy about that, right? I would actually probably, this is a bit of a stretch, but I would probably recommend this for fans of Monopoly. Um, you know, yes, they, they do exist. Quiet you. <laughs> There are fans of Monopoly out there, and I will give nobody who likes Monopoly a hard time. I won't. I won't do it. Um, everybody can like their own game for all sorts of different reasons. It's completely cool. I liked Monopoly when I was a kid. Nothing wrong with it. And if people like, if people tell me they like Monopoly, and just say like, what what kind of games would I suggest? My first suggestion would definitely be Catan. Right? To me, Catan like basically replaces Monopoly for almost everybody. But it kind of depends what they like about Monopoly. If people like the idea of building up, if they like the theme, they like the idea of building up kind of, maybe not real estate, but they're building up businesses, right? Like they're, they're kind of, you know, owning property. In this case, it's, it's visual property, it's signs. 
and you know you're trying to to get people to land on your property in monopoly it's other players and this is kind of a non-player character right it's just random customers um you know if people like that sort of theme um you know i would probably steer them toward this but again you can't really buy it now um who knows if they'll ever make a new version of this um but if at all you're interested in unique games games that like if you want a game in your collection that nobody's ever done anything like it before or since that I've heard of, and you just you want to have just this real real nice variety in your collection, you you wouldn't be able to go too wrong with this one as long as you can get past the randomness. If if you can accept that style of game, that uh, what we call the old the old American style of game, rolling lots of dice, you know, laughing or or crying at your misfortune. Um, and in the end, everybody had a good time. Uh, and there are definitely decisions to make. You can definitely do well at the game or do poorly at the game. Um, but it doesn't really matter who wins or loses, right? If you win, great, congratulations. You did have a better strategy, but you also had a bit of luck. And that's what's needed in the business. Thanks for watching. Remember, older games like Filthy Rich, if they were good in the first place, don't stop being good, right? Just because new games come out. Take care.